Deja. Vamos a comenzar con el seminario de hoy que es eh, parte de la serie de seminarios de microbiología, bioquímica, farmacología y fisiología. Así que tenemos muchas gracias por estar aquí y gracias por eh, poder eh, compartir recursos entre todos los departamentos. Eh, we have here today our eh, speaker today is Dr. Rick Tarlington, distinguished research professor from the University of Georgia and a former co-advisor and friend for some years. I don't, I'm not going to say how many. <laughs> Dr. Tarlington obtained his BA from the University, Wake Forest University. Then he obtained a Master in Science from Texas A&M. And he moved to Wake Forest where he did his PhD in immunoparasitology and moved to the University of Rochester for a postdoc in immunology. He then joined the faculty of the University of Georgia as an assistant professor and has fast moved to professor of cellular biology and distinguished research professor and founding director of the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases at the University of Georgia. He has received several awards and has been uh, participating of the Tropical Medicine and Parasitology NIH study section. Among those awards, the Boros Welcome Fund Scholars. He has numerous publications in uh, very good journals, including Nature. And he's going to talk today about immune control and disease development in Chagas disease. And please, we are videocasting this seminar. So if you are going to ask any question, could you please use the microphone? In Spanish, por favor, usen el micrófono, que si no, no se puede. Las cámaras están seteadas para ese micrófono. Gracias. Well, thank you, Adelpha, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me if I um, speak in English, because my Spanish is very poor. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. I uh, especially like seeing some old friends, including Adelpha, who um, was my first graduate student just a few years ago, uh, when we were both very young, and we're still pretty young. But uh, um, it's good to be here, and uh, I hope you'll um, uh, enjoy the, the lecture today. It's okay, Adelpha. So I, um, I got a little uh, ribbing about having the, the uh, Brazilian currency shown here, but I'm showing Brazilian currency because this is Carlos Chagas on the... Uh, 10,000 cruzados bill, and uh, Brazilians uh, honor their scientists very nicely by putting them on currency, although unfortunately uh, when this was um, initially released it was about, it's worth about $20 and now it's worth um, fractions of pennies, so you can't find them anymore. Uh, but uh, still, they, Carlos Chagas is there in the life cycle of T. Cruzi and on the back a picture of uh, Chagas in his laboratory. So uh, that's the, the topic today is, is Trypanosoma cruzi infection and Chagas disease. And uh, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about T. Cruzi and Chagas disease, but mostly about um, how this infection is controlled and what we think we know about disease development, why people get Chagas disease. And um, Tomorrow I'm, I'm doing a workshop on um, 
identifying uh, targets of immune responses, specifically CD8 positive T cells and how you identify, how we've identified uh, epitopes that are recognized by CD8 cells. And uh, so I won't go into a lot of those technical details today, but uh, I will talk about that tomorrow. Um, so a little bit about uh, Chagas disease and, and, and T. cruzi infection. So this is a protozoan that infects about 20 million people in uh, Latin America, primarily. Uh, the infection range extends uh, into Mexico and into the U.S., actually. There are relatively few cases in the U.S., but, but they do occur. And part of the reason there are a few cases there is, <coughs> as you see on the far right, this is the, the type of environment in which transmission normally occurs, a substandard house that, that is infested by insects, the reduvid bugs on the, on the bottom uh, right there, that uh, carry and transmit uh, T. cruzi. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, so this is, uh, this is transmitted by reduvid bugs, which are, which are blood feeding insects. They solely feed on blood. And they normally live in, in forest environments. They live in burrows of animals and in palm trees where they feed on uh, basically any sort of uh, animal that's around birds, but also uh, all, basically all mammals. And uh, they like living in, in environments like this where uh, they can hide in the, in the roofs and the walls. And at night, there are lots of people or animals or whatever to feed on in the house. And the, so they have easy access to, to blood meals. And so uh, during the day, they're difficult to see and find. But at night, they will come out and feed. And they transmit uh, the infection not through the bite, but through uh, the feces. So as they take a blood meal, they defecate. And in the feces are the parasites. So the parasite runs, they're picked up. Uh, by feeding on an infected host, develop in the gut, and then are released in the feces when this bug takes another blood meal. So it's a little bit of a strange transmission cycle, uh, but it, it works. Um, the stage that gets released in the feces are these metacyclic trypomastigotes. It's a flagellated form that um, uh, can circulate in the blood, but is non-replicative cannot replicate and has to invade cells in order to replicate. So uh, this, uh, this form will circulate <coughs> in the tissues or in the blood and will invade a large variety of types of cells. Uh, in, in culture, you can get essentially any cell that will uh, adhere to plastic or glass can be invaded by T. cruzi. In vivo, uh, parasites disperse very widely to all, all tissues and organs. But uh, ultimately, they tend to persist in muscle. And um, in muscle, so this metacyclic stage invades initially in a, in a phagosome, but then uh, 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 gets released from that phagosome into the cytoplasm of the infected cell and transforms into this intracellular amastigote form, this rounded up, non-flagellated stage. And this is a stage that is replicating. So as parasites invade, release into the cytoplasm, transform into amastigotes, then they go through a replication cycle that usually extends over four to five days and results in several hundred parasites from the initial entering parasite. These will then convert into the trypomastigote flagellated stage. They will burst out of the cell, circulate in the blood, and reinvade other cells. So again, these are non-replicating stages and um, must penetrate cells in order to, to divide. And this is what gets picked up by insects that feed on infected uh, animals. So it's a relatively simple uh, life cycle. This is, uh, I didn't mention, the epimastigote stage is a, is a stage that's in the gut of the insect, and it's another replicating stage. So it's, a, it's, it's not a, uh, a, a very complex life cycle. There are two major stages that the mammalian host sees, this blood stage, trypomastigote, and this tissue stage, amastigote. And uh, we're primarily interested in this stage for a number of different reasons. One is that there's been a lot of study of this extracellular trypomastigote stage. And quite a bit is known about its biology, about its uh, surface antigens, uh, 
uh, about its penetration of cells, <coughs> but um, very little effectively has been done with this stage in terms of control and um, especially in vaccine development. So a lot of things have been tried to combat this infection at the stage of this extracellular form, and most of that hasn't worked very well. Um, this stage has been less well investigated and less was known at least five or six years ago about the immune response to the intracellular stage, and so we've, we've focused on that very heavily. The other reason we focused on it is that this is a replicating stage, and if you can, if you can attack the parasite at the stage of replication and prevent replication, then you can uh, presumably very effectively control it. Um, and that towards the end of the talk, I'll talk more about Chagas disease, and this is a disease that occurs in about 30 to 40 percent of people who are infected with T. cruzi, and it involves mainly disease in the heart and the gut. Uh, it's a disease of muscle, and it's uh, a disease that results, uh, we believe, from the persistence, the ability of T. cruzi to persist in muscle. So what happens early in infection with T. cruzi is that parasites go throughout the body, they infect all tissues and organs basically, um, but they get controlled in most tissues except muscle. And so if you look late in infection in experimental animals or in humans, it's very difficult to find parasites at all, but if you find them, you essentially only find them in muscle. And that opens up another area of interest for us is why muscle? What is it about muscle that allows T. cruzi to persist there? And that's one thing we're also interested in. But disease occurs in, in these tissues where parasites persist, and especially in the, in the heart. And um, uh, one of our uh, additional interests is what, um, what's the difference between people who develop disease and don't develop disease? They, they both, both groups are infected. Uh, both groups have persistence of parasites, but one group develops disease and the, and the other doesn't. And there's a spectrum of disease that's seen. So what is it that discriminates between severe disease and, and no disease at all? And uh, what I hope to convince you of is that there, there immu there's an immunological basis for that. It has to do with how well the immune system deals with this infection. So uh, please stop me if I'm speaking too quickly or if I'm not being clear or if you have questions of any. Okay. So I've, I've told you a lot of this already. This is a persistent chronic infection. People who get infected, animals that get infected, are essentially infected for life. Uh, there are probably people that cure, but they're rare and not well documented at all. And um, most people who get infected stay infected for life. Uh, the parasites can go to any tissue, but um, they eventually become restricted, it appears, to, to muscle. Uh, the infection occurs in a large range of different species. Humans happen to be an incidental host for T. cruzi. Um, the preferred host, at least for, for insects to feed on, there's a large variety of other mammals that, that, insects, that these insects will feed on besides humans. So uh, the fact that humans get infected is probably uh, a consequence of the fact that they live in houses where these insects infest. And this is, um, this is bad in terms of trying to control this parasite because it's in so many different species, it's hard to imagine that you could ever eradicate it. Uh, it's good for us in the laboratory because many species are natural hosts for this infection, so we can study it in a mouse system, which we do a lot of work in, and, and the mouse is a normal host. So you, you see an infection and, and disease in mice similar to what you see in humans. So it's a very good model. Um, I'll talk about disease etiology. I told you my take on that, which is that this is a problem of parasite persistence. There are other people who believe that this is a problem of uh, the immune system being um, out of balance, basically that this is an autoimmune disease. And, um, so there's some controversy about that. And there's, the diagnostics are not terribly good for this infection. The therapeutics are, are quite poor, and uh, we have a strong interest in vaccine development. I won't talk about that today, but, but there's relatively few programs uh, focused on vaccine development for this infection. So what I want to talk about mainly uh, and show you data on is how T. cruzi infection is controlled by the immune system. Uh, why we think this control is not complete or what we know about that. Why 
uh, do hosts uh, make a good immune response but can't get rid of this parasite? And then how does this control or the lack of control correlate with disease severity? What is the link between the ability to control and the types of responses that are initiated and the subsequent development of disease some years later? So this slide has a lot of data on it from a number of different studies and, and the bottom line is, is given at the top is that you need a set of immune responses to T. cruzi in order to control this infection. And that set includes producing antibodies and presumably those are important in controlling that extracellular stage that is exposed to antibodies in the blood. You need uh, T helper cell responses, so-called CD4 positive T cell responses, and these need to be of a type 1 uh, cytokine uh, production. So CD4 cells are helper T cells. They provide help to B cells and to other T cells to initiate immune responses and also to activate macrophages and such. And type 1 cytokines, the, the main one is gamma interferon, that these cells need to make gamma interferon in order to uh, uh, effectively control the infection. And then you also need CD8 positive T cell responses. These are T cells that are known as cytolytic T cells and they're also uh, gamma interferon producing T cells when they're, when they're TC1 T cells. Uh, and these presumably have their controlling ability by recognizing parasite infected cells. Okay, So this response is presumably directed mainly against extracellular parasites. This response is, helps this antibody response and also the CD8 response. And then the CD8 response is mainly a response against intracellular parasites, parasites that are dividing inside cells. So what's, what's the data to support that? One nice thing about working in a mouse system and a, as a natural host for this infection is that and the immunology uh, of, of mouse is very well characterized and there's lots and lots of different mouse strains that one can use, including strains that lack certain of these responses. Knockouts in particular genes that cause animals to lack one or more types of immune responses. So that's effectively what we have here is a number of different mouse strains that lack one or more of these immune responses. Um, this shows uh, data from class 1 and class 2 MHC knockout animals. What are those? Animals that lack class 1 MHC fail to develop CD8 positive T cell responses because CD8 cells recognize antigen in, a in association with class 1 MHC. So if you, if you knock out the class 1 MHC genes, you totally lack CD8 positive T cells. But you make antibody responses and you have CD4 cell responses. In contrast, class 2 MHC you can also knock that out, and if you knock that out, you knock out CD4 positive T cells, but you have a relatively intact CD8 positive T cell, and you have B cells, okay? If you make those knockouts in mice, you infect them with T. cruzi <coughs> with a um, sublethal dose. Wild-type animals will survive and have relatively low parasitemias. Animals that lack either CD8 or CD4 cells have higher parasitemias and they die fairly rapidly. And animals that lack both class 1 and class 2 MHC and therefore lack both of these responses have higher parasitemias and die faster. Okay? So you need both CD4 and CD8 cells, at least if you're a mouse, to survive this infection. Likewise, you can use animals like the MU-MT mice, which fail to make antibody responses, but have an otherwise normal CD4 and CD8 response. And here again, these are uh, controls other animals that lack class 1 MHC, the beta 2 Ms and the TAP ones. <clears throat> these are knockouts again in, in, in the CD8 population, and you see the same thing, high parasitemia and early time to death if you lack uh, CD8 positive T cells. If you lack B cells, these MU-MT mice, you actually, the mice do pretty well for a while. They'll survive with low parasitemias for several weeks, but eventually they start to develop high parasitemias and eventually they die. And this happens even if you give them a very low infection uh, dose. They cannot control the infection uh, long term in the absence of antibody production. So 
Not only do you need CD4 and CD8 cells, but you need B cells. And then the last graph here uh, looks at this issue of type 1 and type 2 cytokine responses. So T cells, when they are activated to make responses, they, they have a decision to make uh, in terms of what types of cytokines they will make. And these are, for the most part, divided up into, into type 1 and type 2 cytokines. Type 1 cytokines are things like gamma interferon. Type 2 cytokines are things like uh, IL-4, IL-5, IL-10, IL-13, cytokines that promote a different set of immune responses. People who have allergic reactions make type 2 cytokines against allergens, and that's why they have the set of symptoms they do when they, ha when they have allergic reactions. Um, the STAT4 and the STAT6 are signaling molecules that are involved in the T cell for turning on those cytokine genes, okay? An animal that lacks STAT4, is a knockout in STAT4, can't make type 1 cytokines. So they don't make gamma interferon. Animals that lack STAT6 will make type 1 cytokines but will not make type 2 cytokines, okay? So here you can determine it, at, this, at this bridge point of making a decision to be a type 1 or a type 2 T cell, which one of those is, is, uh, is most important in terms of control and T. Kruse infection. And here you see a, bit, uh, uh, a big difference. A STAT6 knockout does perfectly fine with T. Kruse infection. Doesn't need to make IL-4, IL-13, uh, IL-5. Uh, those animals do just as well as a wild type animal. But in the absence of STAT4, and therefore the absence of type 1 cytokines, these animals look essentially like the animals that have no T cells. They will uh, develop high parasitemias and they'll die. So not only do you have to have CD4 and CD8 cells, but those cells have to be making a set of cytokines that are of the type 1 type, okay? Okay, so that tells us something about the, the, the array of immune responses that an animal needs to make in order to control this infection. Uh, we've focused in, as I said, on these intracellular stages and on the recognition of infected cells by CD8 positive T cells. So what, what does this involve? So these extracellular stages, these trypomastigotes, as I said, invade a cell and then they round up and start dividing as these amastigote forms. Uh, for a long time, it was thought that once T. Cruzi entered a cell like this, it was um, not recognized by the immune system. It's basically hidden from the immune system because it's inside another host cell and therefore not accessible by antibody molecules or other molecules. But um, it's also known that infected cells have means of telling the immune system when something's wrong inside that cell. And that means is the sampling of the contents of the cytoplasm and the display of peptides in association with class 1 MHC. So all cells in the body, all nucleated cells in the body have class 1 MHC all over their surface. This is the basis of transplant rejection in individuals because they are of different MHC types. And what those MHC molecules do is they present to the immune system peptides that are derived from all proteins that are in the cytoplasm. So in a normal cell, the, so the cell is always processing and degrading proteins through the proteasome, transporting those into the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and then displaying those with MHC molecules on the surface of the cell. <clears throat> if this is a normal cell and is not infected, the immune system, uh, T cells of the immune uh, system do not recognize anything as being foreign about this cell. There's nothing wrong with it. However, if one of these peptides or multiple of these peptides are derived from some intracellular parasite, T. cruzi, an intracellular bacteria, a virus, even uh, uh, mutated proteins in a tumor cell, these peptides will be displayed and potentially you have CD8 positive T cells that can recognize that foreignness and can kill this infected cell. And it kills this infected cell by lysing it or by producing cytokines that uh, allow this cell to become activated to kill the, the pathogens that are inside of it. And so we're interested in these guys and particularly in what they're recognizing, what parasite antigens are there, 
are being presented to the immune system and how these guys play a role in control of the infection. In addition to these knockout sorts of experiments where we can, we can show that CD8 cells are required for survival, we can also show that if one generates CD8 cells that are specific for, for one of these, oops, for one of these peptides, if we, if we make a pool of these CD8 cells that recognize one of these T. cruzi peptides, we can transfer these cells to naive animals and protect them from infection, okay? And that's what's shown in this experiment, generating a T cell line that is specific for one T. cruzi peptide. If we transfer those cells to an animal, to a set of animals, and give them a lethal infection with T. cruzi, the uh, animals that received no transfer or a transfer of a, of a T cell line that's specific, in this case, for adenovirus, those animals die, whereas the animals that received T cells, CD8 positive T cells that are specific for this one parasite peptide, survive. So um, another way of, of, of looking at this issue of what these CD8 cells are doing is using this sort of transfer system to uh, study the, the, um, the effector function of these CD8 cells. And so as I said, uh, <coughs> these CD8 cells have two major types of activity. They can kill this parasite infected cell and they can make gamma interferon, which will induce this cell to kill parasites or activate other cells in the, in the area around this particular infected cell. So one of the questions we asked was, which of these activities is most important? Is it the ability of these cells to kill, or is it their ability to make gamma interferon? So the way we approach that is to generate, first generate parasites that expressed a molecule that we could, um, that we had tools to study well. And what we chose to do was to transfect T. cruzi with a gene that encodes chicken ovalbumin, okay? This is <coughs> a molecule that's widely used by immunologists as a model antigen. And uh, there are lots of different tools to to study this, uh, the response to this molecule. And one of the main ones that we're using here is a T cell receptor transgenic mouse where all its CD8 cells are specific for ovalbumin, okay? So you have a ready source of T cells that are specific for this one antigen, right? And we made a parasite that expresses this one antigen. And then we use this T cell receptor transgenic to generate cells that made either gamma interferon, in this case, or IL-4. So these are so-called type 1 CD8 cells or type 2 CD8 cells. <clears throat> one population uh, makes gamma interferon, the other population makes uh, IL-4, and actually a, a little tiny bit of gamma interferon. But both populations have cytolytic activity, okay? So now you have T cells that one can do these sorts of transfer experiments with, except one set will kill and make gamma interferon, and the other set will kill but will make IL-4 rather than gamma interferon. Okay? And the question is, do both of these protect or just, just one of them pr protect? Do they protect because they have, both have cytolytic activity, or does the cytokine production determine whether they protect or not? And uh, the, the result is that actually, interestingly, both of these uh, cells protect, both of these sets of cells protect, but they don't protect because they're both cytolytic. They both protect because they both end up making enough gamma interferon to protect. How did we determine that? Well, we determined that by making these T cell re receptor transgenics, back crossing them onto a background that couldn't make gamma interferon, okay? So that's what's shown here. If you take TC1 or TC2 cells, <coughs> these or these, when they're on a wild type background and transfer them into animals and then challenge those animals, both of them protect, okay? And the initial uh, interpretation of that is that, well, they must protect because they're both cytolytic, 
okay, not because of the cytokine production. But if you now make these TC1s and TC2s so that they cannot make gamma interferon, these are knockouts in gamma interferon, <coughs> then neither one of them protect, okay? So they still have cytolytic activity, but they have to be making gamma interferon in order to protect. And what happens in these transfers is that this small population of gamma interferon producing cells actually expands when you transfer them into mice, and they become protective. So the result of a large number of experiments here tells us that cytolysis isn't sufficient for protection and that gamma interferon is definitely required for protection by these CD8 cells. Okay. So we know that we have to have this CD8 cell response. We know that gamma interferon is critical in that response. Now we have a whole series of other questions about these CD8 cells. What are they recognizing? Uh, how, do, how are these responses generated? Uh, we have some questions about immunological memory that I'll talk a little bit about. And then how do these responses get regulated? Why isn't this response sufficient to cure the animal, essentially? Um, I'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow because that's, that's the, the focus of the, of the workshop. Um, I'll, I'll mention very briefly here a little bit about how we've identified some epitopes. Uh, mainly we've done that by making large numbers of different peptides from parasite molecules that we predicted might be targets of this response. A very sort of hit and miss type approach. We said, okay, here are some things that we know the parasite produces. Uh, can we identify peptides within these proteins that might be targets of CD8 cells? And if we produce those peptides, can we show that they're targets? We're helped in that situation, and I'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow, in that it's relatively easy to, to make some predictions about what peptides will bind to MHC molecules, to certain MHC molecules. Um, and one can do that because there are certain residues, certain uh, amino acids that allow certain peptides to bind to a particular MHC molecule. It's not a perfect prediction, but it allows you to, instead of making every possible peptide in the whole protein, you can make a few peptides for each protein and test those. And that's what we've done here. We've made a set of peptides from a couple of different proteins, and we find that one of these peptides ends up being a target of cytolytic T cells generated in a T. cruzi infected mouse, whereas the other peptides uh, are not targets, okay? And this gives us a, a, a peptide, this gives us a, a way to start to study the evolution of this response in animals. How do these T cells get generated? Where do they go? How do they circulate? How do they, uh, uh, or what cytokines do they produce when they get somewhere, basically to track this response as it's developing. And one thing that's really helped in that uh, um, area is the uh, development of so-called class one MHC tetramers. These are MHC molecules that have been produced uh, in, usually in bacteria, so recombinant MHC molecules that are tetramerized by uh, <coughs> they're having uh, been produced with biotin and then uh, conjugated by, by just uh, adherence to uh, avidin, which has a fluorescent probe on it, okay? So, as I told you, the CD8 cells recognize peptide in association with MHC. So, if this is a CD8 cell and it has its T-cell receptor, what it recognizes is this complex. But this binding of peptide MHC to a receptor is a fairly, uh, uh, it's not a very avid uh, interaction. But if you make a tetramer, if you make four of these molecules together, what you have is uh, each of these molecules interacting with multiple T cell receptors, which gives it avidity to bind to this CD8 positive T cell, and basically gives you a way to identify a T cell that is recognizing that particular MHC peptide complex. Essentially, you can use it like you would a fluorescent antibody to identify a T cell that has a particular specificity, okay? What does that allow us to do? That allows us to detect these guys and determine uh, how they're being generated, how quickly they're being generated, how they circulate in the body, do they go to sites of infection, 
uh, what numbers do they obtain, all that sort of stuff. So this has been a very powerful tool to track the development of an immune response uh, to a particular pathogen. We spent a great deal of time identifying, trying to identify peptides, making these tetramers or having these tetramers made, and then uh, a frustratingly long series of experiments where we could detect essentially no T cells that were recognized by these, these tetramers. And more recently, we've had a lot of success in this area. Uh, and I'll, again, go through tomorrow exactly how we went about identifying these, but this shows you a, by flow cytometry how you can identify, uh, in this case, a CD8 positive T cells that are reactive to this particular peptide that we call APL20. <clears throat> uh, so this is a naive mouse where we're staining by flow cytometry for CD8 cells. So these are all CD8 positive T cells. This is coming from the spleen. These are presumably B cells, uh, CD4 positive T cells, probably some macrophages, probably some NK cells, but they don't express CD8. And then on this axis, we're staining with this tetramer of <coughs> APL20 in association with class 1 MHC and with a fluorochrome that allows us to identify these cells. And in a naive animal, so you, what we're looking for is CD8 cells that are bound by this particular complex, and essentially there's nothing there in the naive animal. In an animal with a chronic T. cruzi infection, we find that over 2% in this particular case of all the CD8 cells bind to this particular molecule. Okay. And this was a great surprise to us because we'd spent a long time trying to identify these guys and we could never get anything anywhere close to this. And in fact, when we start looking um, through the course of infection, out here, this, the previous slide showed the chronic infection where we find 2 to 5 percent of the CD8 cells. Actually, if we look in the acute infection, over 20 percent of all the CD8 cells recognize this one epitope. Okay? So this is a parasite that has about 12,000 genes. Um, this particular epitope is encoded by a set of molecules called the transialidase molecules. The parasite has, ten, has a thousand transialidase genes. Yet the response in this case is focused primarily on this one single peptide. Uh, that's a big surprise to us. I don't have a very good uh, uh, explanation by how that occurs or why that occurs. Why does this response dominated by this one peptide? <clears throat> Again, I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail tomorrow, but we've identified over 400 epitopes that are similar to, the, to APL20 that are encoded by different members of this transialidase family. Okay? And why this particular peptide as opposed to the other 400 don't dominate the response, I don't know yet. That's one, one of our major questions. One characteristic of this particular peptide is that it is present in a number of different number of these different transialidase genes. So this is another advantage we have in T. cruzi is that the genome has recently been sequenced. We've also done uh, a proteome analysis, which I'll talk about more tomorrow. But we know there are 18 different genes in the annotated genome that have this APL20 epitope. So that's one reason perhaps why it becomes dominant. But APL21 is present in 100 and almost 170 different genes. Why is it, is it, it dominant? Okay. One characteristic is perhaps how well these bind to MHC. But you can see these two peptides differ by only one amino acid. Where is that here? An N versus a K. So one of these is a very dominant response. The other is, is essentially no response. So, um, you know, this gave us a lot of information generated a lot of new questions, but it also gave us a tool to do these sorts of studies to start to ask how this response develops and, and what happens to these T cells during this course of infection. So that's what we've, we've used it as a tool to do these sorts of things. So one of the things we can do is we can say, well, what, what is the effect of the dose of infection on the generation of these uh, T cells? And not surprisingly, 
as you increase the infective dose, you generate a higher number of these particular T cells recognizing this epitope, okay? More parasites in, more T cells get generated early in the course of infection. If you go out, so this is day 15 post-infection. If you look at day 100 post-infection, these numbers all come down to about the same level, two to five percent. But early in the infection, you generate a stronger response with more parasites there. Another interesting piece of information that, again, surprised us was that depending on the parasite strain that one infects with, uh, you get a different level of these particular T cells. So this is the one, this is the strain we do most of our work in, and at the peak response, in this case, 22% of all the CD8 cells recognize this particular epitope. But in the case of um, the Silvio strain, only about 2% of all the T cells recognize this epitope. Still a dominant uh, response, but much, much lower than this guy, okay? Why is this? I mean, we know this epitope is present in nearly 20 different genes. It's very unlikely that the Silvio strain has none of those genes, okay? It, almost certainly that epitope is there. Why is it so dominant here and less dominant here? We don't, we don't know the, the reason for that. So that's, these are other questions that, that are open that, that we're hoping to, to, uh, to answer. One of the biggest questions, one of the, the biggest things that this tool allows us to do is to start to look at what happens in terms of immunological memory. And this is, is interesting to us and I think interesting to the field in general because very little is known about what happens to immune responses, especially CD8 responses, in chronic infections, okay? What's known about control and the generation of memory is mostly gleaned from studies in infections, mostly viral infections, that one cures, okay? You get an infection, you generate a CD8 response, you get rid of the virus, and then you have those cells for the rest of your life. You have memory, okay? What's less understood is what happens in a chronic infection like this one where you have an infection, you generate the response, you control the infection, but the infection stays there. You never get rid of it. What happens, do you ever develop memory? Do you ever develop real memory cells? Or does the presence of antigen prevent you from developing full memory? And there's, there's good data that that is the case. Uh, so one of the things we're interested in is what happens in chronically infected animals and chronically infected individuals with respect to their T cells? Do they have this memory phenotype? And can you um, manipulate them to become better effector cells? Because what we have in chronic infections is a very good immune response that is just not quite sufficient to clear the infection. So can you make that response just a little bit better so that you actually cure rather than have persistence. And that's, that's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. So what can we learn from this sort of thing? Well, so, so what happens in a normal immune response is that CD8 positive cells get stimulated by the presentation of antigen, this MHC peptide complex, interacting with the T cell receptor on a CD8 cell, and a bunch of other interactions also uh, taking place. I haven't talked to you about these, but, but there's a lot of other signals that have to be passed here. And this results in the expansion of these CD8 cells. As I just showed you in the previous graph, at 20 days uh, post-infection, 22% of all the CD8 cells recognize one of these peptides. So you go from a very small number of cells reactive to a particular epitope to a very large number of cells reacted to that, that epitope. But then this you, you can't maintain this huge population of CD8 cells for every infection that you ever have. What happens, has to happen is that as antigen gets cleared, you have a death of a large number of these cells. You have a homeostatic mechanism that decreases this level of uh, the frequency of cells, but you end up with a frequency that is above the initial starting background. And this is part of what happens with memory is that you go from very low frequency to very high frequency and then come back down to, to, to a level of persistence that is above the background but not, not way up here. So we know already that we have 
this sort of memory going on because we can look at <coughs> these cells and see that, yes, we have an expansion, yes, we have a contraction, and then we have a persistence of these cells. So what, what are the characteristics of these cells? Are they true memory cells? Are they good effectors? Or are they somewhat insufficient in really dealing with this, this infection? And so again, to, to, to uh, approach some of those questions, we, we depend very heavily on flow cytometry and on looking at surface markers that help us identify certain types of T cells. And, and what kind of characteristics they have. And some of these markers are shown here. I won't go into to a lot of detail in these. Uh, CD43 and CD11A are activation markers. Once the T cell has seen antigen, it will upregulate these markers and will, in general, keep these uh, expressed at a high level on the cell. So one can tell if a T cell has seen antigen by whether it expresses CD43 and CD11A. CD62L hap, uh, uh, basically is the reverse. As a T cell gets activated, it downregulates CD62L, and this allows the T cell to circulate to areas of infection. Okay? So if you look in a naive animal at the whole CD8 population, what you see is that most of the CD8 cells are CD62L high, a few of them are low. These are antigen experienced cells, presumably they've experienced antigen of some sort. Uh, most of them are CD43 low and uh, uh, CD11A low. In a chronically, in a T. cruzi infected animal with a chronic T. cruzi infection, and we're also looking at CD44 here, this is another activation molecule. What you find is that most of the CD8 cells now are CD, or a large proportion of them have now downregulated CD62L. They have upregulated CD43, and they've also upregulated CD11A. So a large number of, CD, of all the CD8 cells have experienced antigen. That's what you'd expect to see. You've got an infection. You've got a lot of activation of CD8 cells. What about cells that express, that recognize this one T. cruzi epitope? Here, we can't tell what the specificity of, the C of these cells are, okay? We don't know what these cells, what antigen they're reacting to. Presumably, it's something to do to T. cruzi, but it, we don't really know that. However, if we look at just the ones that we stain with this MHC tetramer, we know for sure that these cells recognize this T. cruzi peptide, and we can ask, what's happening to these T. cruzi-specific cells? And so we have a lot fewer dots because we have a lot fewer cells. But again, you can see that most of these, 77% of the APL20 specific cells, <coughs> have downregulated CD62L, and most of them have upregulated CD43 and CD11A. They are antigen experienced, they are uh, circulating in the periphery, and they're capable of being effector T cells. Okay? So they look like they're competent based on this sort of analysis. Um, we can also ask whether those cells can make certain cytokines. And so if we, again, target just uh, CD8 cells and look at their ability to make gamma interferon, so this is stimulating them and looking at their ability to make gamma interferon, a percentage of them can make gamma interferon. And if you look at those gamma interferon producing cells, again, they're CD44 high, CD 62L low, the same phenotype we saw in the, in the previous slide. So these cells that are responding to T. cruzi have all the appearances of being competent effector CD8 cells. They should be good effector cells. Uh, then one can ask, well, what happens if you remove those cells out of an animal and transfer them into another animal? and look at their ability to react to the parasite, okay? So this is a bit of a complicated experiment. What we've done is we've taken, <coughs> we've taken this population of cells that is, uh, <coughs> that has downregulated CD62L, and we have sorted those out using a, a fluorescence activated cell sorter so that we have CD62L high and CD62L low cells. And we have these for both CD4 and CD8 populations. 
So I'm just going to focus on the CD8 population because that's mainly what I'm interested in here. So we sort these cells out so that we have CD8 cells that are either high or low expressives for CD62L. Then we, we stain these cells with the fluorescent dye, CFSE, that uh, allows us to determine whether these cells proliferate once they've been transferred. Okay? So we sort them out, label them, transfer them to another animal, and the, a naive animal, and then infect that animal. And the question is, when we do that infection, do these cells actually respond to the infection? Are they activated by the fact that they're seeing parasite antigen again? And does it matter whether they're CD62L uh, low or high? And we determine whether they proliferated or not because they're, they're stained with CFSE, and every time they divide, they dilute out the amount of dye. Okay? So you start with a population that is very bright, based on, again, this is fluorescence. Uh, this is a uniform population of very bright cells, so they haven't divided. And this is when we've transferred these cells into a naive animal and then haven't infected them. So we transfer these cells, they sit in the animal, and they don't divide because they haven't seen antigen. However, if we infect those animals, what you see is this population of cells moves this direction because each time that population of cells divides, the amount of fluorescence gets diluted. So you end up with a population of cells that is, a, is a basically negative for, for fluorescence. And so what we see is that in the case of both the CD62L high and the CD62L low population, they both will divide fully. Actually, the CD62L high population divides better. You get a higher population of these than the CD62L low, but both populations are reactive. Okay? So what this tells us is that not only can we identify these cells and not only do they look like they are effector cells, but they actually act like they're effector cells. If you transfer them to an animal and infect that animal, these cells expand and do what they're supposed to do. Okay? Yes, ma'am. What, what happened with the top panel where you put in the Yeah, so this, so, yeah, so what you have here is a very few number of cells that spontaneously divide. Okay? And that's, um, for the CD62L high population, that's known to occur. So one thing about memory cells is that not only do they expand in number, but they also, because they, um, because they have to be around presumably for a long time in the absence of antigen, they have the ability to occasionally replicate in the absence of antigen. So, so it's called homeostatic proliferation. So if you, if you study a memory cell population, what you see is that every uh, week or two, they'll go through a division, just one round of division. And presumably that's what we've seen here is that a few of these cells have divided. The bulk of them are still non-dividing, but a few of them have divided. Yeah, it's a good question. Other questions? Yeah, I have one. Yes, Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So actually, we have tried this in a chronic infection, and uh, essentially the same uh, the same thing happens. Is that if you transfer these to a chronic infection, these cells uh, do expand. Okay. Right. It should not, or yeah, yeah. The but the level of stimulation presumably uh, changes. So that peak of growth of of responsive cells also correlates with the load of parasites. So if you look at numbers of parasites in the tissues, it correlates almost exactly with that. It's as the number of T cells go up the number of parasites start to drop, and then the number of T cells also start to drop. And presumably what you do is you reach a level of parasites that is insufficient to maintain this high level of T cell proliferation, right? So in chronic infection, 
No, you have a very, very low level of parasites. Actually, undetectable by by most. Yeah, I should have should have uh, stated that. So, so here, um, so here, if you if you if you plotted parasite level either in the blood or in the tissues, you find almost the exact same profile. That it peaks around 30 days, and then actually it comes down to where you can't detect parasites in the blood and it's relatively difficult to detect them in the tissue. And so that's, that's actually an area of interest for us is, is um, what is that level of parasite and what would happen? So, so we've done some experiments where we've gone back in and we've reinfected animals, uh, this same animal at some point down here. So we've given it another big slug of parasites, a million parasites at some point down here. And every once in a while we'll see a little blip in these cells, but but usually not. Um, but so so we think what's happening here is that the num the load of parasites is is low enough that you do you do get some stimulation, but you don't get so much that that you you activate this population very fully, and that that correlates with the markers that we see on this cell. Um, I didn't focus on it, but um, let's see. Yeah, if, if you look in, um, well, if you look in an infected animal uh, in the CD8 population and ask how many of those cells are actively making gamma interferon, very few of them are. So they're not being actively stimulated in vivo during that point of the infection. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned only the level of parasite and chronic infections, right. but have you looked at actually um, the phenotypic differences? Are there any genotypic or phenotypic differences that you see in that low, right. um, that population? Um, yeah, it's another great question, and no, we, we haven't done that. Um, I, I'm, I'm less driven to do that experiment for a couple of reasons. One is that, especially with, with respect to the molecules that we're looking at um, because, well, let's take APL20, because this is an epitope that is expressed by so many different genes in the parasite, uh, I have a hard time believing that the parasite shuts off every one of those genes that, it, that has that particular epitope. So, so one, um, one reason for persistence could be that, you know, you generate this immune response against this one focused epitope and then the parasite shuts off those genes that express that epitope, right? Like the right, <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, I know for certain that we can, we can isolate parasites from those animals and we can detect responses uh, in infected cells to the epitope. So those parasites are still expressing that epitope. We have looked at that. Okay, but we haven't looked sort of globally at those parasites to say, okay, what's different about them at the beginning of the infection and now after they've gone through this immune selection as it is. Certainly there are changes. I'm not, I'm, I'm less convinced that those changes um, are reflected in the immune response to them, but, but I mean, it's a very good question. It's, it's something that's worth looking at. It's kind of hard, uh, again, in that particular set of genes because we don't have tools to identify. So there's a, the thousand different transallidase genes. There's no way we can study their expression of all thousand. We don't have the tools to identify each individual one even. So, so doing that sort of study would be difficult. But it would be nice to know, you know, does this set of genes go on and off as a result of selection? Yeah. Other questions? Okay, great. So, um, so what do we know about, so, so a little conclusion, this, this APL20 business, this is, this is a, an immunodominant uh, epitope. It's observed early. We see it in all strains, but it's, it's, it's variable. And the cells that are uh, responding to this particular epitope have this memory phenotype that you know, they replicate when we transfer them, they respond, they have the right markers on their surface and that sort of thing. The things we don't know much about is how is this immunodominance generated? Why is this one epitope the focus, uh, such, such a strong focus? Um, and, it, and we've kind of taken the same approach with, the, with humans that we've taken with the mouse to try to identify, okay, what's, 
are there dominant epitopes in human infections? And do they come from this same family of genes? So can we take these transialidase genes and identify an epitope that many human patients recognize? And so far the answer to this is no. We've looked at a lot of different peptides in humans and essentially we, we haven't seen anything that looks anything like the APL20 response in this mouse. We see epitopes that get recognized. They're, um, you know, reasonable levels of them, but, but nothing like what we see in this mouse. So, so either this particular mouse infection is a little bit of a, an anomaly and we've stumbled onto something, or, um, and, and I kind of favor that idea, is that, that really we're looking at an animal that has a very restricted MHC type uh, and that because of that, th the immune response gets focused very narrowly, whereas in humans and in, in outbred animals, you're going to have a much wider response and, and less likely that it's going to be focused in so, so specifically. And that's what this, this suggests to us. I can't say that, this, that we won't find anything because we haven't looked at every possible peptide that the parasite produces, and nor will we. There are just too many of them. But, but from what we've looked at, we don't see that. Um, and then the other thing we're trying to do is to look at uh, what happens if we, if we go back into this system and start to manipulate the response of these cells. So um, can we uh, go back into these guys and vaccinate with uh, a construct that would boost these cells up even further, and if we do that, what happens to the parasite load? Can, can we actually use this response to really generate a better immune response? And that's, that's something we're working on now. Um, <clears throat> so then the, the, the last sort of thing I want to talk about is, is uh, why is this control not complete? So we, we've, obviously we have a very strong immune response to several epitopes and, and one in particular, why is this not sufficient to get rid of the parasite? You know, it controls parasites down to a low level, but why don't, why don't they, uh, uh, why aren't they totally cleared? And um, so there's a couple of different things we're working on. I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about this and then a little bit about uh, 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 the generation of these responses in different individuals. The other things we've looked at, I won't talk about some, um, Altered peptide ligands is, is a fairly complex thing where we're, we're interested in the possibility that certain of these epitopes will suppress the responses to other epitopes, and we have a little bit of data for that, but it's, it's really an unfinished story right now. The other popular thing in immunology these days is, is, is regulatory T cells. And so uh, in most infections, what you find is that you stimulate a nice strong response, but at the same time you have so-called regulatory, they used to be called suppressor T cells, but they're not called suppressors anymore, now they're regulatory. And uh, that these cells sort of dampen the immune response a little bit to control things to, to prevent it from getting out of control. We've looked at this and, and so far we don't find a, a role for these in, in regulating these, these CD8 responses, but again, this is a, a bit of an unfinished story. Um, so this gets us into the realm of, of Chagas disease. And so what, what is Chagas disease? And it's, um, there's a, very, uh, a quite varied literature on Chagas disease. And, and I like to uh, quote this because it, it, this is from a, a textbook published in 1926. And it sort of reflects the fact that there's a lot of misinformation about Chagas disease pretty bad here, but it gets, it's, it's also continues into the, into the current. So, so um, uh, I'll, I'll read you this very briefly. Uh, it talks about T. cruzi multiplying in the heart, and very often, and with most dire results, parasites invade the brain and spinal cord, which does happen, but it's pretty rare. When this happens, mortality is high, and it is only a pity that it is not higher since it would be better if death always eliminated these unfortunate trypanosome victims who are spared only for an unproductive, piteously mutilated life doomed to grow up with the intellect of an infant as paralytics, idiots, or imbeciles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, this is a very well-respected uh, parasitologist of the time, but, uh, you know, the, not only is this, this not true, it's a little harsh, too, I think. Um, so, 
So there, there's, there's a lot of information about Chagas disease that isn't quite accurate that still persists in the literature. So what is Chagas disease? So this, this shows you heart and, and gut from uh, Chagasic patients. And essentially, uh, in humans, 20 to 30 years after infection, in about 30 to 40 percent of people, as I said, uh, they start to develop clinical symptoms of, of Chagas disease. And this is largely seen in enlargement of the heart and thinning of the muscle wall. So these are hearts where uh, a light bulb has been placed in the middle and you can see the, how thin the muscle wall is. Apical aneurysms are common and in the gut, in the colon, and the esophagus, you also lose muscle uh, elasticity due to destruction of muscle tissue. And <clears throat> this studies of Chagas disease have been, at least initially, were very much focused on, on, uh, on uh, standard uh, uh, histopathology. And so if you look early in, a, in a, an acute infection, one sees a situation like this. This is normal muscle tissue here, and here in the middle you have a parasite infected cell. So each one of these dots in here is, is a parasite. Uh, what you don't see here is any inflammation around this infected cell, okay, which is a little strange. I mean, people look at this and say, well, you'd expect here you've got all these parasites in this infected cell, yet the immune system isn't detecting it. And this is one of the reasons why people concluded that once T. cruzi went inside a cell, it was hidden from the immune system. Okay? In contrast, if you look in a chronically infected individual, you see this sort of situation where you see lots, uh, very few muscle fibers and a lot of inflammatory cells. So there's no parasites here, at least that one can readily pick out, all of these are mononuclear cells, okay? They're all inflammatory cells. This uh, section of tissue actually came from a person who had T. Cruzy infection but had no clinical symptoms, died in a car accident, and it was then determined that they had um, an inflamed heart and had, had, uh, had uh, Chagas disease. But at, at this point in, in, in the process had not shown any clinical symptoms. So you can have a lot of damage obviously without showing clinical symptoms. But here, so, so the situation here is lots of inflammation and no parasites. And what, what people concluded from that was, well, you know, your immune system has obviously gone crazy. You've got lots of inflammation. There's nothing stimulating that inflammation and you're destroying tissue. This must be an autoimmune disease. Okay, and what's rarely seen is this sort of situation, and this is actually uh, this is actually a slide from one of those uh, knockout animals that lacks uh, CD8 positive T cells, and here you have a parasite infected cell with a lot of inflammation in this area, but um, these inflammatory cells actually end up being they're mostly granulocytes because this animal doesn't have CD8 positive T cells, but this is is what you rarely see parasites and inflammation in the same area. So uh, the, the result is that, is that there's a lot of misunderstanding about what Chagas disease is. And what I think Chagas disease is, is a situation where you have T. cruzi infection, increasing number of parasites, stimulating of these effective immune responses, control of that parasite level down to some, some low level, and then this control occurs but the parasite persists for, for decades. And as a result of the persistence of T. cruzi and the immune response to it, there starts to be an accumulation of damage over time. And that eventually this damage reaches a point that clinical disease occurs in some individuals. And in some individuals, probably very little damage occurs, or relatively little. And I think the difference between those circumstances are, is how effective the immune response is at controlling the parasite without causing peripheral damage to the tissue. So what's the evidence for that? Um, well, there's a couple of things here. One is that if we, we, all the data I've shown you so far has to do with T cells that we isolate mainly from the spleen. What happens if you look at T cells in the site where parasites persist, in the muscle tissue? If you isolate those cells and look at them, what you find is that they, as opposed to, s to cells from the spleen that are very good at making gamma interferon and very good at having killing activity, the T cells that you get from the muscle don't make gamma interferon and they don't kill. 
Okay, so one thing we see right away is that the T cells that we find in the spleen are very competent effector cells, but when they go to the muscle, they're now not competent effector cells. So persistence of parasites in the muscle may have something to do with the fact that when T cells go to this site, they don't carry out their effector function as readily as they did when they're elsewhere in the body. Why is this? We don't know that. We've, we've tried, we've looked at things like, are there regulatory T cells here that, are, that is suppressing this response? I personally think it has something to do with muscle, that there, there are a couple of characteristics of muscle that prevent the full activity of some T cells. And, you know, we have a few ideas about that. We have a little bit of data, but not enough that I'm, I'm really confident to, to talk about. Yeah. Okay, in this case, or, or, I mean, so, so, yeah, so the experiment is we, um, in this case, uh, we isolate the cells and we're stimulating them, in this case, with uh, anti T cell receptor antibodies. So they're, it's not parasite antigen. So we're just asking can the cells in the spleen make gamma interferon? when they're stimulated non-specifically, okay? And if you do that with a, with a naive animal, you get essentially no response. Uh, if you do it with, with a, a chronically <laughs> infected animal, you get a very high percentage of responding cells. Would be, uh, if, you, if you give them a, a parasite infected muscle cell, right. even if it's a split cell, right. will you see the same? Um, we haven't done exactly that experiment. Uh, mainly because there's, well, in this particular mouse strain, there's not good muscle cell lines and, and generating those is difficult. Um, I can tell you if you give it, um, well, we've, we've done that in other systems where we've taken, yes, we actually have done that experiment. If you, if you take these spleen cells and expose them to uh, parasite infected <laughs> muscles, they, they react very well to parasite infected muscle. So it's not anything about those muscle cells per se that prevents, they, they are presenting antigen, okay? And they're not themselves turning off the T cells. That's using muscle cell lines though. It's not using primary muscle, which, which may be different. So they're, they're transformed cell lines. So yeah, the, the real experiment would be to take muscle, primary muscle and infect that and see if you can get responses to these cells. And we haven't done that. It's a good question. Okay. Um, okay, so, so, so one last piece of data uh, has to do with, with human patients and, and the development of disease and the association between disease development and generation of immune responses. And so I'll just make this very quick because it's, it's uh, uh, it's a result of a, a study that took a long time to do, but essentially what we're looking at here is people that have different clinical levels of disease. G0 is no clinical disease and G3 is severe disease, and then in between are G1 and G2. And this is based on EKGs and echocardiograms and, and chest x-rays to determine uh, the level of clinical disease. So the patients are, are grouped into these groupings and we have a set of controls who are uninfected. So all of these are infected. And they've all been infected for at least 20 years and we know that because of where they've lived and how long they lived in the city where they're not being exposed. And then we've looked at the ability of uh, T cells from these guys to make interferon gamma again in response to T cruzy. And what you see is that of the G0 and the G1s you have a range of responses, but in general, these guys have a higher set of responses than the G3s in particular, but also the G2s. So people, and these, these are statistically different results, so again, you have a range of results, but in general what happens is that people who have more severe disease have less ability to generate gamma interferon in response to T. cruzy antigen. And this would be this is consistent with our prediction that people who develop disease have a less efficient immune response to the parasite and control it less effectively. <laughs> this is correlative so far. And what we're doing now, what we've just started is a study where we're starting with 
a group of G0 patients and we're going to follow them over hopefully 10 years, at least five years, and look at their, uh, look to see whether these individuals, the low responders, end up developing disease at some point during the, during this follow-up period. Okay, so let me then summarize uh, briefly. I think I've shown you that the CD8 cells are crucial for immune control of T. cruzi, <coughs> that we've identified some targets of this response, in particular this transialidase uh, set of genes, that these uh, CD8 cells that are specific for this transialidase epitope, this APL20, have uh, cytolytic activity, they produce gamma interferon, and they have what looks to be a, an effector memory uh, type phenotype that um, that these CD8 cells control, but they don't get rid of T. cruzi, and that the development of Chagas disease results from a persistence of T. cruzi and the inability to regulate well the response to parasite. And uh, we believe that persistence may be related to perhaps to this suppressive environment in the muscle, something about muscle that prevents effective immune responses from, from being uh, generated. And uh, then that this last piece of data, that the variation in the level of T cell responses to T. cruzi correlates with whether one develops severe disease or, or not severe disease. And uh, I want to acknowledge Burroughs Welcome Fund and the NIH who funded our work. The, uh, the last set of data I showed you was, was work done in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina by our uh, collaborators there. Um, most of the immunology uh, work that I showed you was done by Diana Martin, who's a, a postdoc in the lab, and she's worked with a number of other uh, people. And then some of the work on the muscle-derived T cells was done by Jennifer Levy and, and Josh uh, Kotner. So thanks for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer any other questions. Very interesting work. Uh, okay. I see you have focused most of that work in, into uh, or towards the epitope identification of targets, uh, you know, CDA targets. Right. What is known about the recognition of CD4 T cells early in the infection? What epitopes or what peptides are recognized? and whether IL-12 is produced, and in what levels, and how long does it last? Yeah, um, that's, those are all very excellent questions. Um, in terms of epitopes, CD4 epitopes, uh, essentially nothing is known. Um, there's, there's been no work on that at all, and um, we may or may not get into that, that Defining CD4 epitopes is a lot more difficult than the CD8 epitopes, and um, one can also make these class two MHC tetramers, but it's a lot much more trickier thing than than the class one. So, um, so there, there's more problems with that, but it's certainly an area of interest. One one thing that we're starting to do right now with both the CD8 and CD4 approaches the question of IL-12 and, and the timing early in infection. So uh, uh, one of our interests is what happens, um, how do these responses initially get generated and what's required to generate those responses? And so uh, the experiments that, that we have just started is to, is to do infections in sites that we can then track parasites and track responses in the draining lymph node and determine what interactions are going on there. So, for example, we have ways of, of uh, putting in parasites that we can determine when the parasites, if they get picked up by dendritic cells, carried to the draining lymph node, what cells they interact with there, do they interact with CD4s and CD8s, do they make IL-12, is that IL-12 required, what's the timing of that, do the parasites take a few days, a few hours, a few weeks to get to that draining lymph node, all of those sorts of questions. And I think, you know, I, I think we have the set of tools now to answer those questions, uh, but we, we're not very far along in, in actually doing that. But it's, it's you know, there's, there's a whole long list of very good questions there. 
the decrease in immune response in the chronic stage. Right. Have you looked at the expression of uh, FAS on those cells, uh, <coughs> which may explain a phenomenon of peripheral tolerance at that moment? Yeah. Um, we, we are looking at the APL20 specific cells now in the chronic infection, looking at uh, uh, BCL1 and 2 and FAS and these molecules that are in involved in apoptosis and, and regulation of those cells. And I don't have an answer for you specifically on that. Um, we have looked extensively at the cells in the muscle. So these, these cells that become non-responsive, there's a number of different markers that have been identified that relate to peripheral tolerance like uh, FAS and the BCLs and also some um, NKG2D, some these regulatory molecules that, that are on these cells. And we haven't been able to find anything on those cells that would explain their inability to respond. So we, uh, FAS is it, FAS, FAS ligand interactions don't appear to be uh, the problem. Um, we've also examined TGF beta receptor and TGF beta production and its result. Uh, BCL2 isn't upregulated on the, or isn't downregulated on those. So we, so far we haven't found anything on those cells that would correlate with what's uh, the markers that are supposed to be responsible for peripheral tolerance in those. But we've looked extensively. Um, regarding the patients, I was wondering whether um, there is a difference between those that stay in endemic areas and are re exposed yeah. versus, let's say, somebody that got was there by accident right. and and leaves somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, that's a good good question. Also, we so most of our studies have focused on people who uh, were infected in endemic areas have now moved to the city where they're not re exposed and. You know, the main reason for that is ease. You know, we work in Buenos Aires and, and we can access those patients very easily. When we, we had great difficulty detecting responses to individual peptides in that group of patients. And so we, we surmised that maybe the fact that they hadn't been re-exposed for 20 years, their responses might be very, very low. And so we decided to go to an endemic area and screen with the same sorts of assays in people who were being re-exposed. What we found there immunologically is that they have a higher uh, level of T cell responses than we found in this group of patients. And that's, that shouldn't surprise you. They're being re-exposed and presumably they're being re-stimulated. We haven't done anything. We, and you know, we're trying to get some physicians in that area interested in the question that you ask is, is that, does it have anything, do you see any differences really in the percentage of those who go on to develop disease re-exposure? We don't know anything about that. And as far as I know, there's no studies that have been done on that. There, there are some studies in experimental animals that suggest that re-exposure uh, makes disease worse. But um, those are mostly in mice over very short-term studies with very high numbers of parasites which is not what happens in a, in a normal infection. So, um, so I don't know what the answer to that's going to be, but, but it's a very good question. Um, the mice that you do when they get the, the high load of parasites, well, how do they die, actually? Yeah, that's another good question. <laughs> um, it depends on, uh, so if you take a wild-type mouse and, and give it high-dose parasites, uh, I don't know why they die. And I've asked pathologists that as well who've looked at the mice and, and they can't really tell me why they die. Um, you know, they do have uh, reasonably high levels of uh, cytokines like TNF that would, that, that isn't healthy, right? Uh, they don't die, <coughs> in wild type mice at least, they don't die <coughs> of overwhelming numbers of parasites. Um, so if you take a if you take one of the knockout mice that um, that die at say day 25 of an infection and you look at it at day 20, you know there are 10 times as many parasites in the muscle of those animals than in an animal a wild type animal that's dead at the same time. Uh, so it, it looks like from the parasite, very soon 
Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in, in those knockouts, they're, they're dying from overwhelming parasite load. No question about that. A wild type mouse, they can, you know, certain of them will die on the same sort of time scale if you give them enough parasites. They're not dying of the same level of parasites, but I, I can't tell you what they're dying of. Yeah. It's, it's sort of interesting, but, but it's not really all that interesting because in human patients, it's very rare. You know, you don't, immunocompetent individuals rarely die from the acute infection. So, so determining why a, an animal dies of acute infection is, is, is interesting maybe for that animal, but not really applicable, very applicable to human infection. Thank you. Thank you for a great audience. Good questions. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah.